uh, this today. This is our second week, second session of our Mary's Hope Crusade. I want to welcome the Turning Point Mission Center Church, a church where God loves to abide, a church that's turning lives towards Christ. Praise be to God. We want to ask as a blessing. I know she outside. All right. She's here, but we're going to just, again, thank those who join us from week to week for our recast. We are thankful for you who join us each week. We want to thank God for the Sorrells who are here. Uh, yes. Brother David, his wife, Renee Sorrell, who are here. Thank you. Amen. 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 And uh, our subtopic is finding Jesus in the book of Revelation. Hallelujah. And we're going to dig deep into that. I'm Pastor Arnett Owen, the pastor here, and also the presenter for our crusade. And we are just excited about what God has already done. And I, I, I asked God to help me contain myself because as I was studying, and preparing for today. I was just getting excited with things that I'm learning and how God is helping me to really understand how to dig deeper into the Word of God. We're going to uh, just uh, let Elder Blessing comes up. She's going to give us our review uh, from last week's session. She's going to open up with prayer and follow the prayer. She's going to direct the review. And we want to just let you know that God is pleased with you being here. Because he tells us in his word to study to show ourselves approved unto God. So I don't know about you, but I want God's approval. So because of that, I, I, I and not only that, I love spending time with God. And one way we spend time with God is through study of his word. Hallelujah. It's just like any marriage. A marriage that's healthy, you spend time together. You talk. You get to know each other. You care about each other. You show that love. That's the same with God, our relationship with Him. We got to spend time with God. We got to love on God. We got to trust God. We got to surrender all to God and, and be faithful to God. Hallelujah. Come on, Elder Blair. We're just talking, give you a chance to come up. Amen. Amen. We want to now yield to Elder Tanya Blevins, who will be bringing our review uh, for today. Interpreting 
the need to study history, looking at things that have already taken place. Mm -hmm. And then a person can plug into various symbols that How are presented. That? How about that? Mm -hmm. This particular school takes the span of history from the early Christian church until Christ, Jesus Christ's second coming. Then the fourth school of interpretation is the spiritual or the idealist. This school subscribes to a personal application from the book of Revelation based on a major conflict between good and evil that constantly repeats itself. So it relates to Christians in any age. So across from whether it happened in 2000 BC or 2000 AD, it still relates to believers even today. So we talk about those particular, those four uh, schools of interpretation on how people uh, understand and, um, and utilize the, uh, the scriptures of prophecy. And then we started talking about um, how, like the first part of Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 and 2, we talked about how uh, the, the four schools of interpretation was applied to that particular scripture text. So I think that's where we kind of stopped off at. And then we started, we also, oh, we also started looking at some of the keys, mm -hmm. the, the keys of explaining revelation. That's right, that's we right. uh, started with the, the, four, the four keys. We talked about literary context mm -hmm. and looking at what's before that particular scripture and what's after to be that. able to yeah, get an yeah, understanding. Yeah. And then we also talked about historical context. When you're looking at things that have already happened, I like to call it cross-referencing. All right. Okay? Then you're looking at key words, certain particular words in Scripture that align in the past from, like, Old Testament prophecy. You're aligning it with those particular key words. Then we also talk about comparing with the rest of Scripture, the other Scriptures uh, on that particular subject matter, that line upon line, precept upon precept. Come on. Yeah, yeah. So I think we just stop with those four keys, and I think we're supposed to pick up with the last. Okay, so we, we're supposed to pick up with the last three for those seven keys. And this is your review for this morning. Amen. 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 We want to thank Elder Blevins for that wonderful review. Amen. Amen. And Amen. in order to keep going forward, we're going to. Uh, Keep building. That's what Revelation is. It's a building block. Amen. And uh, we want to ask you to, uh, Elvis and go to the next slide. All right. This is our session overview. And uh, our subtopic for our crusade is finding Jesus in the book of Revelation. So, Elder Blevins already did the review. And today we're we'll studying the last three keys of for Bible explanation revelation. That's the overview. Let's go to the next one. And these are learning objectives. We want to know the seven keys for interpreting the book of Revelation. We covered four of the seven. I will be doing the last three today. And we want to understand and apply the seven keys for a Bible explanation of Revelation. And we are looking for key words, and they're there. We'll look at them later. All right, we continue. Uh, this is our expectation. We uh, did the overview, learned objective. Now these are our expectations. And what we want to do, we want to know the ultimate theme of the book is that there is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if anybody asks you, what is revelation? What is it all about? Well, one quick, God bless you, see you. One key area, you know, phrase you use is the revelation of Jesus. So if it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, that means Jesus revealed to us the things he wants to know about himself. You know, I like that to sometimes you have an iceberg. So, well, tell me about yourself. Or you go for a job interview and so, say, well, tell me about yourself. Well, this is what Jesus, this is what the book of Revelation is. It is Jesus revealing to us things about him that he wants to know. 
And then our other expectation is uh, accepting those things. I know that the book of Revelation contains a rich tapestry of symbols, but instead of taking them literally, we want to use the seven keys to explain the revelation and trust the Holy Spirit to reveal uh, this to us. Amen. Amen. And uh, this is our outline. We've already said those two things. We'll go to the next one. And these are the three keys we're going to be looking at. We're going to look at our check. This is number five. Key number five is check your Old Testament roots. Key number six is study, I'm sorry, structure in the book of Revelation. And these are three structures we'll find. We'll find parallel, we'll find numbers or symbols, and we'll find the pyramid. And we're going to talk about that in, as we get to that session. And our last point, uh, the seventh key is Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. And our summary is understanding the seven keys for interpreting the book of Revelation. And our next session will be next Saturday, April 20th at 11 a.m. All right, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, again, we want to ask you to bow your head for prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this revelation you've given to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Oh, Jesus, we've come to the final book of the Bible for a revelation of you. So, Jesus, we're asking you to give us a fresh revelation of you. We're praying that the Holy Spirit will strengthen will lead and help us to see new things as we study this powerful, revealing book. Father, speak to us through your holy word. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. These are five of the, the seven keys. Elder Gladden covered the first four literary context historic or cultural context, keywords, comparing with other scriptures. And uh, we, we looked at those more in depth last week, and she gave a great summary of those. And today we're going to start with key number five. Look for Old Testament roots. Amen. Amen. So, I want to um, ask you to look with me at the book of Revelation. I'm sorry, Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 22 and 23. And as we're prepared to look at that, I want to just share an observation you probably observed too. As you've read, and of course, as I've read the different parts of the New Testament, we have uh, come across various quotations from the Old Testament. And this is an example. Matthew chapter 1. Starting in verse 22, says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. So as we look at this passage of scripture, we see that the word of God tells us uh, that this was done, that uh, all that took place will fulfill what the Lord has said through his prophet. And as we look at uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 22, 23, we see that after the angel explained to Joseph uh, that Mary conceived and have a baby by the means of the Holy Spirit, it told him that in verse 22 that all this took place so that the things the Lord said to prophet will be fulfilled. Then it goes on and says that a virgin shall be with child and bring forth a son, tell you what the name is going to be, and it's all having a God with us. And if you were to look, and I didn't put it in your slide, that but in uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, this is what the word of God says. It says, a virgin shall conceive, and for his son, and should call his name Emmanuel. So isn't that what verse 23 just said? So we see Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 is quoted in Matthew chapter 
1, verse 23. And I'm going to stop there. Jesus himself used the Old Testament to quote things. When Jesus had been up uh, in the wilderness, he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And when Jesus came back down, who would we count? He, Satan was there, trying to tempt him. And in Jesus' dialogue with Satan, Jesus quoted uh, Deuteronomy, stripped from Deuteronomy. If you were to look at uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 4, you would see where Jesus answered the devil. He told him, uh, it is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And if you would look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, you will find also what uh, uh, the, that is said. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, it says, Man, uh, where well it says, that he might make me know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceed out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. That's what Deuteronomy 8, 3 says. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus was quoted from the Old Testament. Doesn't stop there as the Savior continued to try to tempt Jesus over there in Luke chapter 4, verse 8. Jesus said to Satan, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written. And see, we got to learn that. When Satan come out of my sister, bro, we got to, if we don't know the word, we can't do this. But if we study God's word, and he tells us in, in, in 2 Timothy 2 15, if we study God's word to show ourselves approval to thee, a work that need not be ashamed, but rightly about the word of truth. When the Satan come and the Timothy come, we do just like Jesus. Jesus said, It is written, Thou shalt uh, wish the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. That he said in Luke chapter 4, verse 8. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, the word says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him. So you see how Jesus connected the scripture together. And then in Luke chapter 4, verse 12, Jesus said, Thou shalt not tip the Lord thy God. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, uh, he said, Ye shall not tip the Lord your God. So Jesus himself quoted from the Old Testament. So if it's good enough for Jesus to use, we should also use it as well. Uh, that's the fourth, that's the fifth key of understanding, uh, being able to look for the Old Testament root when we're studying prophecy especially. And so the Old Testament references found in the New Testament, it goes beyond the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And give an example, we'll go to the next slide. In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, uh, this is one of Paul's uh, famous statements. The just shall live by faith. We probably all use that at some point or another. The just shall live by faith. That's what Paul says. You know where Paul got that from? The next slide, you know, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. You see what Habakkuk said? Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not an upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. They that quote. So the point I'm making here, uh, just like uh, God did it, we have to learn to also look for, I mean Jesus, we have to learn to look for Old Testament roots when we're studying the Word of God, especially the New Testament. So uh, those who like to do a lot of research and dig and count numbers and things, there have been, uh, next slide, those who does this, those who count and do a lot of research found that approximately 300 Old Testament quotes are found in the New Testament. 300. Now, how many books we have in the New Testament? Everybody has to get one. They're not a trick question. 27. Amen. Thank you. 27. So out of, out of those 27 books in the New Testament, how many of these 300 quotes do you think found in the book of Revelation? How many say 10? Anybody want to put their hand up and say 10? How many say less than 10? How many say more than 10? All right, I thank you for being bold enough to put it up there. You know, you tell me just now, but that's really the answer. It's not one, absolutely not one direct quote in the book of Revelation. Now, 
I want you to understand the difference. Quote versus reference is a difference. Okay, see, when I showed you what Jesus, Jesus was using exact quotes. He was quoting from uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, you see how Paul was quoting from Habakkuk. You see quotes. You can go to the Old Testament, you can go to the New and find almost the word for word or very, very close. Now, there's not one like that in the book of Revelation. Of course, Revelation still have a lot of the Old uh, Testament roots in it, just not quotes. Uh, I want to understand the difference. So that's why I want to make sure it's not one direct quote. If you search from Revelation 1, Right to Revelation chapter 22, you will not find a direct quote uh, from the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. But there are a lot of uh, value there. There are a lot of good, good uh, meat there still in it. You'll find a lot of Old Testament root in, in the uh, book of Revelation. And so I just want to make sure uh, you understand the difference there. And, and based on my research, we found that uh, more than 100 years ago, Canterbury New Testament scholar Henry Barquet Sweet, uh, who wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation. Now, uh, this scholar claimed that there's over 278 Old Testament references in the book of Revelation. And but they're not of a direct quote, but they're references. And for this crusade, we draw, we are drawing a lot of our Old Testament. In scholar, information from a scholar named Jacqua Dewan. And Dr. Dewan actually wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation. He said, what, Pastor Arnett? You got an Old Testament, Old, Old, Old Testament scholar, and they wrote a, te uh, a, a commentary on the book of Revelation? Yes, they did. And Dr. De uh, Dewan said uh, there are over more than 2,000 Old Testament roots in the book of Revelation. More than 2,000. Did you hear that? That's a lot. And not only did he say that, there was another uh, scholar, also by the name of William Milligram. He claimed about 2,000, also more than 2,000. So the book of Revelation has a deep root connected with the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I think the difference, I asked the question to you that I posed myself, can we really understand the book of Revelation if we don't have a foundational understanding of the Old Testament? Can we? No, I agree. So without the Old Testament interpreting the book of Revelation, it's like a tour in the Grand Canyon in a helicopter with a pilot that's blind. Let that sink in. You're touring the Grand Canyon, and your tour guide is a blind, Helicopter driving. What do you think gonna happen? It may seem beautiful for a minute for the you you see all this stuff, but he's blind and he's driving your helicopter. So later you're gonna crash. And that's what happened. We try to understand the book of Revelation and don't have a foundation or functional knowledge of what's going on in the old, we're gonna crash. We're gonna run into some roadblocks, things that can't be understood. Now, as we study the book of Revelation, I want us to remember two key words. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Now we'll go to the next slide. And we're looking at Revelation chapter 1. We can paraphrase that by saying the revelation of Jesus Christ in symbols. Because there are two key words, revelation and symbolize. Revelation and symbolize. And we're to read Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servant things which must surely come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So that signified it, uh, the showing his symbols and, and these things. So revelation and symbolize, those are two key words. So we ask the question, what is the code for the symbols that John used? Whenever you have a uh, symbol, you gotta have code to understand it. That's why uh, most of them don't even think about it. But mathematics, you got a plus sign. You have to know what that plus sign means. We all know it means to add something together, but that's a symbol. 
uh, a, a mana sign or line, we know that means to take away. Or X, that we know it means to multiply. Or a, 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 a line when you're drawing between two numbers, or a dot and a line and a dot, we know it means to divide. We know because that's the code. But if we didn't know the code, we wouldn't be able to do the mathematical equation. So that's a simple way of looking at it. So we're trying to understand the book of Revelation, but we don't understand the code, then are we going to understand it? No, we're not. So that's what's going on here. And, and so John's readers will quickly make their connection uh, with the Jewish Bible of their day, but the Romans would not be able to make the connection so John was using symbols, and we got to remember, he wrote the book of Revelation at the end of the first century. And John was a Jewish leader. He was a, so he understood things. So when, when, when we read Revelation, next slide, Elder, when we read Revelation, you can paraphrase it by saying the Old Testament rule. We're looking at that. The Revelation is, a, a Revelation of Jesus is in symbols. And, and yet, what is the code? I asked that earlier. What is the code? The code is the Old Testament. In order to understand all these things that's happening, we got to understand the Old Testament root. Remember, we talked about the first four. We got to uh, uh, look at the, con the literary context of what that script is saying. In other words, understanding what's taking place, what's happening in that particular passage of scripture, what's happening in the, that chapter, what's happening in that book. That's why you have to read before and after to get an uh, uh, understanding of the context. And then you also have to understand the, the, cult, the historical or the cultural context. Understanding when that writer wrote that book, what was going on, what was the environment, what was the climate, those things. That's what you have to understand. And then you have to be able to understand the key words as, in, in there as you're reading that scripture. And then also be able to compare what you're reading in that scripture with other scriptures in the Bible. So using those four uh, keys and connecting them with uh, knowing, being able to identify, recognize the uh, Old Testament root. And that's the key to understanding the symbols in the book of Revelation is the Old Testament. Amen. Amen. So as we understand it, they have a fundamental and a functional understanding of the Old Testament that will help us unveil or unlock uh, those symbols. Now, let's take a look, let's try to look at this in a different aspect. Let's do a little deeper into this. Let's go to the next slide. Um, well, I just said that. Let's go to the next slide from the elder. So let's look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 13. The word says, and he does great wonders so that he make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, that's what Revelation 13, 13 says. Can you think of a time in the Old Testament where the same kind of thing happened? And most of you probably think about Elijah up there on Mount Carmel. That's one of the famous stories we tell our children. When we are teaching in the children chapel, that's one of the stories we tell our children. We even tell our children at home, we read Bible stories at home. That's one of those stories we tell them. How Elijah was an Israelite and the prophet Baal and how Mount Carmen and how there was a showdown and how uh, God, Elijah God, was more mighty than, than, than Baal, the prophets of Baal and their God. And how uh, they were trying to uh, set this, well, first of all, you know, they were trying to bring a fire and everything. They were doing everything, and they both built their altar, and they were waiting for the fire to come. But they people did all types of things, all heroic types of acts and praise, and made all types of sacrifice, cut and touch, and all types of crazy stuff. Did the fire come down? No. No, it did not. But when Elijah began to call on his God, what happened? Fire came down. So you see how he in Revelation 13, Tied back to uh, over there in the book, uh, 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 in the Old Testament there. So we see how the story continues to come together and, and there. In, in, in looking at the Old Testament, looking at the New Testament. But I want to say, just use this as a springboard, before we project into the future and make guesses or search as to what might happen in the future, we should first 
look to the Old Testament and then take that foundation for a better understanding of what John wrote in the book of Revelation. Take an understanding. Go back. Look at what's happening in, in the Old Testament. And then after you get that foundational, functional knowledge of what's going on there, you can understand more about what you're reading about in, in the book of Revelation. And sometimes there is simply a general reference. Like I said, you know, there's no direct quote. One of the uh, people that the scholars said it was over 2,000 different references. Uh, so some of them are just something familiar with the Old Testament. But in, in, in Revelation chapter 1, this next slide, Elder. But in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, we look at verse 12 and 13, the word says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt with pep with a girdle, golden girdle. So we look here in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. John reports seeing seven golden candlesticks. And he said, in the midst of them, he saw one likened to the Son of Man walking among them. Now, can you think of any uh, Old Testament root that may have golden candlesticks? I can. In my study research, uh, I found a couple of I'll give you two of them for an example. In the book of Exodus, chapter 25, verse 31, Exodus chapter 25, verse 31, the word says, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. And then 2 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 7 says, And he made ten candlesticks of gold. So you look at this, what we just found out in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, that um, the candlestick or lampstand, some translation said, serve as obvious uh, function of light. So that's an obvious one application, but there are other applications also. Just like the recent storm we had, some people lost power and they used candles to have light. So an obvious uh, application of a candle is light. But when we think of seven candlesticks or seven branches of a lampstand in the Old Testament, I think about the sanctuary service. You know how the sanctuary service was, and how you had the holy place, most holy place, and where you had the courtyard first, the courtyard, the holy place, the most holy place. So um, it says here that John said he, he saw Jesus walking among the candlesticks. And he saw him also in, in verse 20 of the same chapter, Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, it says he saw him in the midst of the seven churches. So one of the largest phrase in Revelation with an Old Testament root can be found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, where the word says, Worship him, uh, go to the next slide, Emma. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. That's Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. Now, if you were to look at Exodus chapter 8, verses 8 through, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, and I'm just going to focus on verse 11 just for the sake of time. Now, you see on the line, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. That's Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. Well, in the book of Exodus chapter 20, verse 11 says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is the rest of the seventh day. So you see, it's not a direct quote, but you see the references there. Heaven, earth, and sea. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, it says those same things, heaven, earth, and sea. So it's not a, a direct quote, but it is a reference. So we get to Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, 
And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna look at that God's will in our preacher series here. But instead of, of, of looking forward, we will first look back to the Old Testament roots. And when we understand that we have, when we understand the Old Testament root, we have a better understanding of what to look for in the present and in the future. Now, in our last session, we used a rider on a white horse. You remember that? Ella Blevin mentioned that also in her review. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, to illustrate four different schools of interpretation of the book of Revelation. Instead of looking at the first century, or in the course of history, or in some future writer, or even a person application of what happened, we will uh, look at first the Old Testament roots. That's where we start out. Now, if you look at the Old Testament roots, I ask the question: Can we find a writer on a white horse in the Old Testament? Now. In the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, that's Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, there was four horses. There were four riders, four different horses. They had, y'all remember those colors? One was white, another was red, another was black, and the fourth was pale. You had white, red, black, and pale. And that's in Revelation chapter 6. Now, if you are to turn with me, but I, I didn't put it in the slide. But in, Reve in, in Zechariah, chapter, Zechariah chapter 6, you will find four chariots pulled by four different colored horses. Guess what color they are? The same color. They are the same color. They're white, red, black, and pale. So you see how the reference is all, it's not a direct quote. But it all connects. So sometimes the Old Testament root uh, makes the meaning obvious, just like we're talking about the candlestick. Look. And other times these roots are helpful, but may not be obvious. And at other times you might see similarities, but the meaning might still be obscured. So we have already established a correlation, a connection, uh, that there is a relationship between the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. But we'll also, as we continue to study, we'll see plenty of other Old Testament root books, such as Ezekiel, Zechariah, but we just saw one from Zechariah there with the four horses. Zechariah, Isaiah, we looked at that earlier, uh, with, with Isaiah. Uh, 7, 14 was talking about how uh, Jesus was going to be born and everything. So uh, we saw that 7, 14 with that with Zachariah. I'm sorry, Isaiah. Uh, so you look at other books like Jeremiah, Joshua, Deuteronomy, how Jesus used that several times, Leviticus, Hosea, Exodus, 1 King, and even some of Solomon. These are some Old Testament books that we'll find root in the Old Testament connect us to the New Testament to help us understand. So just to close down, uh, the key number five is look for Old Testament root. So we're gonna go back and review. The first one is what? Remember the first key? Literary context. The second key was historical, historical context. The third one was? Keywords. Keywords. The fourth one was? Comparing scripture with scripture, right? And the fifth one, what? There you go. Thank you, Lord. Y'all redeem me. Thank you. Between me and the you got it. Uh, you look for Old Testament roots. Now we're going to go to number six. Amen. All right. The sixth root key is structure of the book. And I purposely didn't have to put it, but I didn't want y'all to be cheating. I want y'all to do this. So that's why I didn't put that slide up there before now. But that's the sixth one. So we come in first five. We got number six. Structure of the book. Amen. There are elements within the actual structure of the book that are instrumental while understanding the message. And that's not just with the book of Revelation. That's just a general book. If you have a textbook 
and you understand the structure how the group is set up, you're going to do a better job of being able to research and understand and follow along with the instructor and do your coursework. So in the book of Revelation, there are key elements. There are key elements within the structure of the book that are instrumental to our understanding the message that's contained in the book of Revelation. And this might not be as invigorating, uh, as, as connecting a current event with a spirit portion uh, of the book. You know how some people see something happening in history, see something happening, out of there, go back and pull all this stuff and say, that's what's going on. We see that every time something big happens, they begin to connect back to something in the Bible. Uh, e e even down to the other week there, number 45 says that he will what? He will call. And he was selling Bibles and, 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 and everything else and, and coming over past over week. He was trying to connect himself that he's that chosen one. You know, people do all these things to try to connect. You have so many people that have been uh, proclaimed to be the Messiah. You claim to have this power, that power. So I'm not picking on him. I'm just using that as a current example. But the part of the Abigail here, we got to understand the actual structure of the book in order to really understand the messages that are contained in the book of Revelation. Now, as we look here, one, one of the most obvious uh, uh, structure is the set of seven. Let's go to the next slide, Elder. If you look at repetition parallel, you see a lot of that in the book of Revelation. You'll see seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven plagues. All this is in the book of Revelation. And they all uh, have very key information for us to, and, and that's instrumental for our understanding of the message that's contained therein. So now we will notice striking parallel when we compare the seven uh, trumpet with the seven plagues. And I didn't put that up there, but you have a, in your participation guide, on page four, the one you got today, you can go over there quickly, just flip page four. It's right after your slides for the, the uh, presentation today. If you go to page four of your participation guide, it got section two on it. Page four, you'll see seven parallel. And what I did there, you got the seven trumpets, and you got the seven plagues. And if you look at the sixth one down here, in your uh, participation guide on page four, section two, the Great Euphrates River, Revelation 14, 9, 14, and Revelation 16, 12. If you compare the seven trumpet that's found in Revelation chapter eight, verse two, uh, it, uh, all the way through chapter 11, verse 18, and you compare what's going on with the plagues in Revelation 15, verse 5 through chapter 18, 24, you will see in uh, the sixth piece on both of those is the talk of the Great Euphrates River. So that's just one example of how you can compare. When you look at that, you see the parallel, striking parallel there. And of course, the Euphrates River is a primary associated with Babylon. So we look to continue on with our slides there. As we look at, um, we got this where you got these seven churches and seals and trumpet and plagues. You also got seven uh, beatitudes came up. I just looked through the book of Revelation, and it's seven uh, different things that talks about the different parts of the blessing. In, 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 and they all contain the book of Revelation. And so additional parallel can be found with Jerusalem and Babylon toward the end of the book in Revelation chapter 17 all the way through chapter 21. So the obvious similarity and comparison between these two cities represent the good and the evil. Go to the next slide, Elder. So you got the seven comparison between the trumpet and the plague and the seven beatitudes. That's on page five of your document. If you're not going to read those, I do want you to look at those at another time. That's page five of your document. And for those who don't have the document, I'm going to read out. If for the seven 
Beatitude, you go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, Revelation chapter 16, verse 15, Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, Revelation chapter 22, verse 7, and Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. All these have the word blessed in it. So you want some beatitudes to be blessed, go to the book of Revelation. You got seven scriptures that tell you how you can get your blessing. Amen, amen. As we continue on looking at here, we realize that repetition and parallel help us to anticipate some repeated periods in the book. Revelation might be repeating information in cycles. One set of seven follow another set of seven rather than presenting a straight line. When I mean by straight line, I get everything serious. It's not necessarily like that. Just because the seventh trumpet comes come after the seventh seal of the book of Revelation does not mean necessarily that the trumpet happened after the seal. The parallel leads us to consider that they might happen at the same time, but one deal could give a different input about the same period. I don't like that to, to uh, day and time. You may, we may be planning a trip. We may be planning to uh, leave the church at a certain time. So we send, I send a text out to the members and say, we're leaving at 11 o'clock from turning point. That's the first text I sent out. Then I turn around, send a second text out, and say, oh, by the way, we're wearing our TP shirts, and we're going to meet up at 1030. So we'll be leaving at 11. They both talk about the same event. We're going to leave at 11. But that first just gave you the, the exact time we're leaving. The second gave you detail about that first one. So that's how sometimes it is in the book of Revelation. You may have parallel events talking about the same thing, and it doesn't mean they're serial coming one up. They, they may all be just coming concurrent, just to other give you additional information about that earlier thing that was said. There's a number in the book, there's a lot of them, but one number significant in the book of Revelation. What that number is? You think I've been used quite a bit today already. What's that number? Seven. seven. That's right. You said seven, you're right. The number seven is significant. Now, I, I, although only seven churches are mentioned, but more than seven churches existed in that area of Asia when John wrote the book of Revelation. So I said evidently the angel who communicated to John was intentionally using the number seven. Intentionally. Now, we've mentioned the number seven, uh, and it seems to be quite significant in the book of Revelation. Are there other numbers? in the book that come to your mind? Are there other numbers? Ten. Ten. Thank you, Ellen. That's a good one. That's right. What else? Twelve. Twelve. That's another good one. Thank you, Ellen. Amen. Three. Three. That's another one. Amen. Those are all. That's good. That's good. Those are very good. Those are uh, ten, twelve, three. Any other? We talked about one more today. Four. I'll try to get two. Four. All right. I got a question for you. Do you think you found a number 13 in the book of Revelation? No. What, 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 what is the name of 13 to, to, to people in general? Bad luck. Bad luck. Come on. Lucky number, bad luck. That's right. Depending on what the said, oh, it's oh, oh. oh. 13, and don't let Friday fall on the 13th. We get all worked up. And, and some people say that 13 is a lucky number, but a lot of people see 13 be unlucky. Some people always sit in, in, in a place that, you know, got 13, you know, number 13 seat or whatever the case may be. You get that. So, you know, people consider 13 to be unlucky or lucky, being almost some bad, and, and things of that nature. But I want to just remind you that in the book of Revelation, 
John wrote it near the end of the uh, first century. And John, being a Christian, he wrote it with a Jewish background. He was relying on symbols from the Old Testament and on current Jewish understanding. Just like if we wrote a book, if we had an assignment, we were given to write a paper. We're going to write the paper from the, it's going to be colored by our experiences. It's going to be colored by the things that we know, the things that we've experienced. That's even when people start talking about parenting and how you read children. A lot of things we do as parents is colored by what our parents did to us. It either influences us not do that, or we do it the same way. Or some of us go to the extreme, try not to be like our dad, or be like our mama. We want to be worse than them. So the thing I'm saying, John wrote from his perspective. So for the Jews, numbers are highly symbolic. But for us, numbers are more like quantity. Go to the next slide, Elvis. So numbers make us think of what? Quantity. But numbers for a Jew make us think of what? Quality. Quality. So what's the difference between quantities and quality? Quantities is more of. Okay. Qualities is the better or the good quality person. Okay. All right. I buy most, most of that. I, I need you to clarify that latter part. But yes, yeah, she said qual quantities is like a numerical value. And qualities is what? The, the value of it, okay, all right, the value of it, characteristic or that type of thing. Yes, yes, that's good. So we got a difference. When, you, when, you, when we think of quantities, we usually think about a value, the number of something. When we think about quality, we're talking about the character or, or how good something is, you know. Someone's willing to pay more money for something because they feel got better quality. It's gonna hold up, you know. Sometimes you get something, and it's not all the time. But sometimes you get something that's inexpensive. You watch it, and it it, it draws up, or it loses form, or it loses color. So it said, "Oh, that was no quality stuff. I ain't buying that." So I just want to put that little stick this there. So uh, when John used number, they think of quality. But we use number, we think of quantity. Now, there are several key numbers for Jews in an early Christian that we're going to look at. And, and, and the study of number is called numerology. So each letter in the Hebrew alphabet corresponds with a symbolic number. I didn't know that until I started studying that. Each number in the alphabet for the Hebrew, and that's true with Greek too, corresponds to a symbolic number. That's not true in America, uh, in, in the Western anyway. A person's name had its own meaning, but also had a number. For example, David. David means beloved. That's the name, the word David. It means beloved. Now, of course, that seems fitting because, you know, they truly love King David. Taking the symbolic meaning of the name, the letters in the name David, it adds up to the number 14. And I found that so amazing because for years I said, I talk about 42 generations, then came Jesus. Jesus came down to 42 generations. Now I understand how they got that. I didn't know it until I started studying. But if, if you look at Matthew chapter 1 and the genealogy of Jesus Christ, you'll find it was 14 generations from the time of Abraham to David. Now, I knew these things, but I never thought of it in terms of breaking down like that. It was 14 generations uh, from, uh, uh, 14 generations from Abraham down to David. And then, from David to the children of Israel going to exile was another 14 generations. And then from the exile to the time Jesus came was 14 generations. So you take 14 times 3, what do you get? 42. So if you look at that in that sense, the, the, uh, the 
numerical value or the new G, uh, King David is Jesus. Jesus is the new King David. 42. Remember the name David with the numerical value of 14? Jesus being the new King David, he came down 42 generations. So, and we're going to look at a couple numbers and then we're not going to wrap it up. I'm not going to try to get all this done. I, 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 I tried. But as I was studying, I said, I ain't no way I'm going to get all this in the time frame. So I'm going to stop after I do a couple more. So you all don't have to think out and look at You look at the book. Oh, show sure, that's some, some pages. Oh, Lord, we're going to have to get all this done. No, no, no. I just, thank you, Lord. I listen to the Holy Spirit. I was trying, but I just, I, I could see no way possible to get it done. The first thing I'm going to look at is number three. Let's go there. All right, good. Next. Okay, number three. I'm just important. Ella Sarah, can you go back to the other slide there because I missed that. In Revelation, numbers are not statistics, but numbers are symbols. Keep that. Hold on to that. That's going to come back again. In Revelation, numbers are not statistics. Remember, when we see numbers, we think about quantities. Remember, when the Jews, because numbers are highly, highly symbolic, numbers uh, mean a lot for quality. So they are simple and not uh, statistics as we look at it. Let's look at the first one. We're going to look at number three. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8 says, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So we look at that. When you think about three, for you or me, from a Christmas, what, what is one of the first things come out of man to think about three? I heard it. The Trinity. What else you saying? Okay, the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's most of true with all of us. But from a Jew perspective, when, when they think about the uh, number three, that symbolizes holiness, which is still God. But it's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You see, they look at it like that. Because all those names were significant in their culture, plus the Adams had significant symbolic value to their name. We say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, because we were uh, uh, raptured in. We were drafted in. We didn't have that uh, bloodline with the Jew over here. We are the spiritual Jew. So they looked at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So if you're looking at three, three symbolizes holiness. The presence, and we and look at that, and we look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 8 here, which says there, angels, the heavenly angels, you know, in chapter 4, in chapter 4 there, Revelation, see they're crying day and night, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come. And you look at that, you see three. Holy, holy, holy. That's number three there. And then after in the middle is Lord God Almighty. So before Lord God Almighty got holy, holy, holy. After Lord God Almighty got which was and is and is to come. Three. You see three being represented there. So in the presence of God for the Hebrew came in the tabernacle. So you look at the tabernacle, the dimensions of the most holy place, which is one of the compartment of the tabernacle, is in cubit. And, and, and it's, it's 10 times 10 times 10. And that's actually 10 times three, 10 three times, which is a cube. If you go back to your math, I was not a mathematician, but I did quite well in math. My husband was really, truly genuine math. Uh, but if you look at that, that's a cube. So the number three also shows up in terms of the three compartments of the tabernacle. You have the courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy place. It's all together with the sanctuary. Three. Then you look inside of the holy place, there are three pieces of furniture. Y'all remember that three pieces of furniture we covered before? The candlestick, the table of showbread, and all the incense, three, see, three, three. 
And even the Old Testament itself, if you were to go and, and look at how they are divided, they're divided in three parts. You got the uh, first is the law. The first five books of the Bible is considered the law. Then you got the next part of the prophets. And then the third part is the writings. So even in that, uh, stuff I've never thought about, no, I've never thought about that. Three, three, three is just driven all the way throughout the Bible. All the way throughout the Bible. And um, in the second number of four, we're going to look at, that, that's three, we covered three. We're going to look at the next number of four. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on four corners of the earth, holding four winds of the earth. Four. Four. But that's it then. Four represent earth. Three represent holiness. Four represent earth. And you think of the major points on a compass. You'll see the north, south, east, and west. Four. Four corners of the earth. The angel in Revelation chapter 7 says, I saw four angels standing on four corners holding four winds of the earth. So, looking at four, three represent holiness, four represent of the earth. And the three angel message that's found in Revelation chapter 14 includes proclaiming the everlasting gospel to those who dwell on the earth. And who, how did it strive? It strived to every nation, every tribe, every language, and every people. Repetition. You see how the repetition is going there? Now, these examples, the four, emphasizes the symbol or the quality of the number four. Number four represents what? Earth. Earth, that's right. So you see here in Revelation chapter 14, it talks about the everlasting gospel to the entire earth. Now, we have two primary numbers we looked at. What are those numbers? Three and four. That's right, that's right. Three and four. Amen. Praise the Lord. Three and four. So the three represent God and the four represent the earth. I have a question for you. What happens when we add earth, when we add God to earth? What happens when we add God to earth? What do you think we come up with? All right, all right, that's a math person in the house, math scholar. You add it up. God is what? Seven. Three. God is three, and the earth is what? Four. And you add them together, you came up with? Seven. Seven, that's right, amen. Four plus three is seven, that's true. Now. Oh, go to the next slide. Um, we're going to stay there for a minute. Three plus four is seven. Um, are you able to find that in the, in the New Testament, in, in Revelation particularly? Yeah, we can find that word, the number seven in Revelation. We've already covered that fact. We can find, we can find that in Revelation. And remember, and from the Jew perspective, when they see numbers, they're thinking of what? Quality. When we see numbers, we think of what? Quantity. Yes, yes. Now that means that if we add God to the world, we have perfection. The number seven means perfection. We, I've learned that a long time ago. I never understood it by putting the two together like that, but it makes sense. You put Three, which is God, the earth, which is the, uh, I mean four, which is the earth, put it together, you have a perfect God. So that's why seven uh, means perfection. The number seven is considered the perfect number or symbol of completeness. Now, of course, there are three plus four with equal seven, so this brings God into uh, brings the world to perfection because God is making perfect. 
And, and that's encouraging to me because we live in our evil, sin infested world. We can have joy and we can have peace of mind because we know God is still in control. Oh, yes, God will let things play out. God will even use evil people to come to some good. We saw that with the children of Israel, how they kept going into slavery. That's why they were in, in under bondage to the uh, Romans when Jesus came. Hard headed, rebellion, not doing right. We said we're Christians, but we act in our own like the world. Something wrong with that picture. So we are Christians, and we got to give us power to rebuke Satan. He will flee. But we, he got us running. Then God's going to let us go through some things. We got to walk in the authority and power God has given us. And that's not being a cliche. We got to learn to act like we believe God's word is true. And the power he has given unto us as sons and daughters, we got to speak those things as if they were, and we got to live holy because three is holy, three be God, and when God is in us, we are transformed people. So, what do you think the number six indicates? Well, six indicates falling short of perfection or completion. Six is the number of man. Remember reading that in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13, verse 18 tells us this. So you consider the creation story. What day of the week did God create man? On the sixth day. That's right. Thank you. On the sixth day. So, and, and so in the book of Revelation, there's a tantalizing number. People get all worked up about it. What is it? Six, six, six. That's right. And it's called the number of man. Mm -hmm. So what happens when we multiply God and the earth? Three times four. Yeah, three times four is what? All right. So the quantity of the number 12, that was the number El Sorel mentioned, 12. But what is the quality or the symbolic meaning of that number? Well, in the Old Testament time, we would automatically think of the 12 tribes of Israel. In the New Testament, we think about what? Uh-huh, the 12 apostles, that's right. And, and so in the book of Revelation itself, uh, it talks about the uh, 12 is the kingdom number. Now notice how New Jerusalem is described in the book of Revelation chapters 21 and 22. New Jerusalem has how many gates? 12, 12 gates. How many angels? 12, 12 angels, each of these 12 gates. And written on these 12 gates are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. 12. So you find how many foundations in New Jerusalem? How many? 12 foundations. That's right. I'm not trying to trick you. 12 foundations. And they have the name of 12 apostles written on the foundation. 12. New Jerusalem has 12 foundations. The name of apostles written on the foundation. Have 12 gates. And, and the 12 gates have the name of the 12 tribes written on them. One gate is a solid pearl. This is how it's been described. So the measurement of the city of, uh, is 12,000 full all along. 12,000 this way, 12 this way, this way. This is how it is. So you look at uh, the shape is like a cube. 12,000 uh, three times. And, and we're talking about the most holy place. That's what Jesus will. I mean, God's will. So somewhere else in Revelation, we read about the inhabitant of the city. And, and that's referred to the 144,000. So can we find that count a number of 12 in, in, in that book. Yes, we can. You look at uh, 12 times 12 is, is, is 144. So I jump ahead of myself. We get back there. Let me get to 10. A number 10. And the blessing said 10. That's a good number. That number is used quite a bit throughout the book of Revelation. So uh, this can symbolize completeness as counting the ten fingers and the ten toes of a newborn. Any mother that had a child, and one of the first thing you look, want to make sure they got ten toes and ten fingers. And then as you get older, you're concerned that they are 
the mental capacity, but the only thing physically you can know when that baby first born is to, do they have all their toes, got all their fingers, and do they have just one hand? You know, you look at that. Ten. In the Old Testament term, the number ten brings to mind the Ten Commandments. And we know the Ten Commandments is a short form of the law. Because the law, was, uh, when you look at the value of the Old Testament, you got three parts. You got the law, the prophet, and the writer. So the first five books are the law. But if you look at the Ten Commandments, that's part of the law. So ten can be a minimum needed for completion. The number ten can also refer to enduring hardship or difficulty as with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How long did they were tested for how many days? Ten days. They were tested for ten days. In Egypt, there was ten plagues. The feast of, uh, uh, of a or the feast of the trumpet lasted ten days, and that led to the day of atonement or day of judgment. Ten. And you can relate the number ten to one thousand. Ten times ten times ten equals to what? That's right. And so, uh, symbolically. This can mean God's completion or God's testing. So you going through a test, you can say, oh, the 10 is really, really coming at me. So the number 1,000 can also be used to describe the tribe, of, of, of the tribe or a military battalion. You remember the story in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 7, where uh, the teenager Daniel, I'm sorry, the teenager David, David, the teenager David, killed the, the giant, what was the giant name? Goliath. Goliath, right. And so, you, you know how he had the whole army of Israel just fear, but they were just paralyzed with fear. And here come this little old teenager out there, trusting God, dealing with the, uh, the sheep and everything. He has had to fight bears and everything to protect the sheep, the sheep that he was guarding. And Jesus, you know, protects us. We can trust him. Let the best not long ago. Whatever it takes. Jesus does whatever it takes to save us and to keep us in his protective coverage. Now, he's not going to just pull us and let us go. We want to get out. He's going to let us go. But he's going to make it so difficult for us to be out of here knowingly. Unknowingly. Unknowingly. He's going to make it difficult for us. So, when you look at that, David, he slew Goliath. And so, when they got back, so symbolically, the meaning of that number uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a thousand. And so when, we, when the people got back, when the army got back, what were the women singing? Oh, wow. King David has gone what? That's it. Solid thousand. David, 10,000. 10,000. I want you to emphasize that 10,000. Now, we're not, they're not physically trying to calculate from a quantity side of it. I mean, yeah. Quantity the side, they're more than talking about the quality of it. They really were saying that if we exaggerated, we were saying David was a hundred times better than Saul. Because Saul had taken, they, they had been, uh, taken over the Philistine battalion. They had taken over. They were too afraid to go to the next level. How many times God opened doors and blessed us to, to walk in, but we're afraid to go to the next level? God has given us a ministry. God has given us a business. God has given us an idea. God has given us something. But we are too afraid to go to the next level, so we settle and stay where we are mm. and complain. Mm. We God's people. We got to walk in authority he's given us. And, and, and instead of this, has really blessed me. I, I, I'm, just, I, I'm just so thankful to God for it's, it's a lot of strength here. I tell you, every morning for a moment, after the Lord, I, did, did, did you really mean it? Because it, it, it's so much to just drill through. And, and, and y'all get the pretty picture. Y'all don't have any idea what it takes to get to this point. I, 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 it's, it's crying and tears and sweat and trying to get this drilled down to this level. And, 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 and people who know me, especially children, I'm a detailed person and I love information, but I got to remember, anybody don't love information like I do. So, Try to drill it down. Try to drill it down. So I'm still struggling with that. That's why I said we're not going to cover all of it today. It's just too much. But we're almost there. We're almost there. Bear with me. So the Hebrew would say uh, 10 times better. That means completely better. That's what 10 means. Completely better. And that's how David 
Daniel and his friend performed. You remember the story of that Daniel chapter 1, uh, around about verse 20 or something, where when, when Daniel and his three companions had been in school for how many years? Three years. They had been in Babylonian school for three years. When it comes time to be tested, the word said they were ten times better than the wise men of the king. Ten times better. In other words, completely better. That's what it's saying. All right, the last thing I'm going to look at, let's go next slide, Elder. The last thing I'm going to look at is uh, these numbers. We always we covered some of them already. 24. First of all, we're going to look at the number two. Number two uh, brings us to mind of the Jewish system where you have to have at least two witnesses to say something's true. Even our court system, we need have to have a witness. Yes. So, two. In the Jewish system, you gotta have two to make that, the, to validate that it says true. And so you need a minimum of two witnesses to establish a fact, to establish a testimony. And Revelation comes right out of the name of the witness. If you were to look at Revelation chapter 11, 3, we're not gonna go there, but that's a point of reference. So we look at two. Um, the number 24 is a factor of 12. 12 plus 12 is what? 24. And if we multiply 12 by 12, what we get? All right, all right. So we already established the fact that 6 is the number of a man. And 666 six, six, um, is, is the number of a man. So we look at that 6. A man is trying to act like God three times. Six. Okay? So two times three is six. Six is the number of a man. And uh, you recall that three represent God and holiness. So if three represent God, two, you gotta have witness, two times six. I mean, two times three is what? Six. So it's number of a man. So the number six, 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 is the number of a man three times. That man trying three times, three different ways to be God. You know, you're real deep in there, and believe that P and M. So you see how people who really are caught up in numerology can just be, be caught up digging numbers, digging numbers. Well, the thing we need to remember, the important thing we need to remember is that when Revelation mentions numbers, we should first of all consider their quality before we consider the quantity. When you see a number, I didn't matter that your man go to quantity, quality, 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 and not quantity. And we learned that numbers are symbols rather than statistics. And we're gonna stop here on this slide. We're gonna stop here. Are there any questions? And I know I gave you a lot, but I gave you some material to study to be ready. And you got the band, you got next week lesson too, so you continue to read and study, because we're gonna pick up here and finish up. Let's review. What are the four schools of, of prophecy for interpreting prophecy? You have the previous or the past. You have the history, the future, and you have the idealistic or the spiritual. Those are the four schools of certain prophets. What are the seven keys? All right, I respect that. The first is the context. I'm sorry, the literary context. Then you got the history <coughs> context, that's right. The third and what? Keyword. Keyword. What's the fourth one? <laughs> Comparing scripture with other scriptures. And the fifth one? Old look for the Old Testament rules. And the sixth one we'll be talking about was? Structure. Structure. That's right. Structure of the book. And we're going to wrap up that. we got a lot more to cover on the structure of the book. And also, Jesus changes everything. And we'll finish that up next week. We thank you for coming, and we're going to ask our brother David for coming. We thank you, first of all, for coming and sitting through this. 
We will come ask him to do his own way, and then we're going to our book call in our service. Is he going to ask him? All right, Brother David.
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The appeal is quite simple. That's the song for the day. Because if we truly trust God, we need Him to walk with us and to guide us every step of the way. And that's what we're talking about here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. We want Jesus. If you want Jesus, to walk with you. You want Jesus to guide you. You want Jesus to guide your mind and control your destiny. And you want to really receive, you want to first of all understand the revelation of Jesus. And you want to understand and receive it. Then stand on your feet. You sit and stand and say, Lord, there are things about your book I don't understand. But from today, I realized that you want me to really know, because this is the revelation of your son Jesus. You gave to your son Jesus, who, who was given to the angel and signified it, so that, and given to his servant, the uh, prophet, so that he could, uh, John, his servant John, to give it to us. So we want to receive this. So perhaps somebody here today that's standing on their feet have heard God give you some direction. But for whatever reason you chose not to do it or you was afraid or whatever, you want to ask God to forgive you and help you now to do a first a new stand with him, to walk with him, to let him guide you and to direct your path. If that's your desire, then you just begin to talk to God in your own prayer language. You talk to God now. Lord, you see your people standing. We all say, Lord, we want, we want to receive the revelation of Jesus. Christ. And we want to understand, we want to believe, we want to walk with you, we want to talk with you, we want to be in your will. So Lord, you see your people standing. And we have to help us to be more and more like you day by day. And Lord, for those times that we want to sleep and you call us to get out of bed, help us to get up. For those times you lead us in a certain direction, help us to follow you and not try to lead you. Lord, forgive us for our shortcomings, forgive us for our sin. But we thank you, Lord, for what we have understood here today. We thank you for giving us understanding of the full school of thought, from prophecy, interpreting prophecy. We thank you for the seven keys you've given for us to understand. These are just the foundation of the, uh, the foundation of the background, the intro to getting us into really understanding your word. But we'll get there. So, Lord God, strengthen us. And, Lord, if anyone here needs a savior, we know you to be a savior. Perhaps someone is listening to this recast and it has some questions or, or need a savior, want you to know a, a church home. Lord, let us move on the heart to call us 1 866 3873. Move on the heart to call 1 866 3873. Let us call. And then, Lord, let us be in a position to hear your voice and to lead into a prayer of repentance or to bring them into the fold, be a part of your family here at Church Point. And we thank you, Lord. Christ today. Thank you for your Savior. Thank you for the revelation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for coming. We'll be here next week at the same time. Uh, keep your book with you.